Well, thank you. You can all have a seat. I guess after you let people in who are coming back at you there. Um, it's good to be back in America. We uh, got, uh, got back a day late because, uh, of course, we did. Um, uh, they had uh, issues, and uh, so we got to stay an extra day. But God blessed, and we're going to be telling you about it. We were down visiting, if you, if you don't know, our church plants in Nicaragua. It was a great trip. Um, some of us got new nicknames. And <laughs> we'll be telling you about those over the next few weeks and, and telling you. Um, we also got to see Pastor Earl. Some of you have asked about that. Um, and we have a video of him that we'll show probably next week. Um, but that was, that was special for us to get to be with him and, and pray with him. Uh, if you don't know, he's... Uh, a pastor partner of ours that uh, was uh, basically uh, uh, made an invalid in a, in a car wreck, and so uh, he's, he's not able to walk still and all, but, um, but he's in good spirits, and he said to, to give my love to Point Harbor. So uh, anyway, I'll, give you, I'll fill you in more details, but we've got a lot to do today, so we're going to jump right in. Are you ready? All right, you don't know where to go, though, do you? Um, Acts 13. Acts 13 and verse number 13. Uh, it's, if, you, if you don't have a Bible, there's one should be in front of you somewhere close to you um, in the blue. It's a blue uh, covered Bible, and that is our gift to you. Take that. It's page 1021 uh, in that Bible where we're going to be. And the, the text is kind of long. We're, we're going to skip a little bit because it's, um, um, it's Paul preaching a sermon. He's done, he does... Similar sermons, he sets it up, and so you can go back and read that if you'd like. But we pick it up in verse, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 13, so if you're there, say, I'm there. I'm there. All right. Now, Paul, remember, it's kind of transitioned in the book of Acts from Peter, Peter, Peter doing stuff. Now it's Paul again. Paul and his companions set sail for Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. So going to these different towns, preaching. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. If you write things in your Bible, you could write quitter uh, off to the side and because he, he just quits. And we're going to talk about that later on. Uh, he comes back, but he quits. So if you've quit, and you're like, man, I, and then God can't use me because I quit. No, it, they used John. He wrote uh, the Gospel of Mark, John Mark, uh, later on. But So John leaves them, but they went on to Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. This is a different Antioch, all right? Same name as the one where they have a church, but it's a different one. It's Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went down into the synagogue and sat down. After reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So they just kind of had an open thing. New people come in. They let them up and preach. And uh, that was an open door. Paul said, or so Paul stood up motioning with his hand. He said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. And then he goes into this, setting it up. So over the next few verses, you know, God chose our fathers, and we're down in Egypt, and then he led them out, Exodus. Then we're in the land of Canaan, you know, it's 450 years. Then he gave us the judges, and then Samuel, and then Saul, uh, King Saul, the first king. And then verse 22, we pick it back up. When he had removed him, God removed Saul, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified, saying, I found in David the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. I underlined that whole sentence. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, who do you, or what do you suppose I am? I'm not he, no, but behold, after me is one coming, the sandals of whose feet I'm not worthy to untie. So he's taking it all the way from the calling of Abraham, really, or, or Israel being made a nation, all the way up to Jesus. Brothers, the sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. Now he's, now he's bringing it home. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him, and though, and now he gives the death, burial, and resurrection off to the side. In my Bible, I always put DBR, death, burial, and resurrection. That's the gospel. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they carried out all that was written of him, all the prophecies, 
They took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. There's the resurrection. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And then in verse 32, we bring you the good news. I underline that. We bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this, he has fulfilled to us their children by raising Jesus, as is also written in the second psalm. And then he quotes the second psalm. We'll, we'll jump past it for sake of time. Verse 36, for David... Now he goes back to David. After he had served the purpose of God in his generation, his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. In other words, he decayed. But he, whom God raised up, Jesus, did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you by him and by him everyone, circle everyone, who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses, couldn't be freed by keeping, couldn't be saved by keeping the law because nobody could keep the law. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded, perish, for I am doing a work in your days. I underlined every one of those words. I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. And then he went out, or as they went out, the people begged that these things, man, they never heard anything like this, might be told them the next Sabbath. After the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism, these are Gentiles that converted to Judaism already, followed Paul and Barnabas. So they're like, man, teach us more. Who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw that the crowds, they were filled with what? Jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And, and Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, you Jews, since you thrust it aside ju and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I've made you a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. That's a quote from the Old Testament. And when the Gentiles heard this, they're happy. They began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. Underline this next. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And then I underline the next two. And the word of God uh, of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of the district. But they shook off the dust from their feet like Jesus told them to do when they go to a place that won't hear the gospel shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And this last I like, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now, today's message is, is this, set up by God for success for God. Set up by God for success for God. Everybody, just about, if you're, you know, normal, wants to be successful, right? We want to be successful. Nobody goes, man, I hope I'm an utter failure. We, we, we want to be successful. It's, it's, it's in our blood, really. It's in our wiring. And just about everybody wants to be successful. And some of you, in the eyes of your friends, your family, you are a roaring success. I mean, you got it going. You got a good job. You got good education, you know. Your kids are in some of the best schools. But some of you, if, if you don't get this right uh, and, and get a corrective, God is one day going to lock eyeballs with you. And this is my warning to you. And some days say, epic fail. You wasted your life. You screwed up your family. Some of you, that you in American eyes, you, you, you got it going on. In God's eyes, you're up to this point, an epic failure. And it all comes down to, and I know this sounds like preacher talk, but it, it is God talk. It all comes down to me finding and doing the will of God. Because some of you, you are a success in the world's eyes. See, Jesus said, what does it profit you to gain the whole world and lose your own soul? And so you, some of you, you're gaining the world, and you might say, well, John, I'm a Christian. Okay, all right, okay. But, but what are you doing? Have you, have you even considered what the will of God is, why you're here, why God wired you like you are wired, why you have the experiences that you've had, and how that factors into the kingdom and the advancement of the kingdom and God's cause through his church? And some of you never even thought along those lines, and you're wasting your life if you haven't, if you haven't gut-checked that. What he created you in your mother's womb for. And he's got a specific will for everyone. And, and when that 
becomes my passion, when that becomes my life search, I experience God like I never have, like I never, ever have. And that translates to the church as well. So only three points today. Somebody say hallelujah. It's like a few weeks ago, it was like seven, wasn't it? Three, three points today. So we're set up, this is the message, we're set up by God for success for God. Point number one, God is already doing the work in our day. See, a lot of times we're like, man, God, we try to get God involved in what we're doing, our plans, our dreams. And God's like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, you got it backwards. You got it backwards. I'm doing the work, you get involved in that. And then you pray about that. And in, uh, in verse number 38, let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work when? In your days. I'm doing a work right now. Didn't just do a work of creation. Didn't just do a work, you know, when I split the sea open for Moses and the boys. I'm doing a work in your days. We are set up for success. You right now, whoever you are, God is setting you up for success in your days, in your lifetime. You know why the church is, is boring to some of you, honestly? It's because you think that we gather here, you know, and read an ancient book about ancient people, and you say, what has that got to do with me, John? What has that got to do with me? Creation, that's cool and all, yeah, I believe it, but that was a long time ago, and I wasn't around. And, and, you know, that Red Sea opening up. I'm sure that was cool if you were there, but I wasn't there. But you're missing a huge, the huge message of this passage in the book of Acts, which is really the message of the whole word of God. He's doing a work in our days. He's doing a work in our days. Our God is already at work. We don't have to beg him to get off the throne to do work in our lives. He's already doing work in our lives. He's already doing work in our church. He's setting things up. He's the initiator of all spiritual work, all of it. God's the initiator, and we track it, all of it, through Paul's uh, uh, sermon here in this passage as he lays it out in verse, look at verse 22. God said, I found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart. I remember, David was kind of a scallywag in some things, wasn't he? But God says, he's a man after my heart, not perfect. He's a man after my heart. Who will do how much of my will? All my will. All my will, which means David wanted to figure out, all right, God, what is your will? What's your will for my life? Why did you make me king? Why did you take me from the sheepfold? Why did you take me from the least of all my brothers? Pass over all my brothers and put me as the king of this nation, Israel, your chosen people. Why did you do that? I want to I be in your will, God. I want to figure it out. I want to join you where you're working. I'm doing a work, God says, and David will work with me and for me. And then in verse 36, look down your Bibles there. And if you take notes, write whatever you are impressed to write there. For David, I love this. David, this is at the end, after he had served the purpose of God, when? In his own generation, died. After he'd, after he'd done the will of God in his generation, not perfectly, but after he'd done it and served the, 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 the purpose of God for his people, for his compatriots, for his nation, for his family. He served the purpose of God, and then he died. God said, come on, come on home. You're done. Good job, Dave. David embraced my will, God says, and served my purpose, and then he was done. Then he points out John the Baptist here in this text, too. In verse uh, 25, look at verse 25. As John was finishing his, what's his word? His course. John was finishing his course. God says, I've got a John the Baptist wasn't just this dude that was kind of wild, you know, and he's out there, and he's all hairy, and he ate bugs dipped in honey, didn't hang around with soy boys. You know, he was, he was, he was, he was a rough man, and he's like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start a ministry. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go preach at people. I'm going to make them all mad. They're going to finally kill me. It'll be cool. That wasn't John. From his mother's womb, God said, hey, guess what? Miraculous birth. No, not like Jesus. There was a father and a, and a mother going on there, but they were old, old, old. And a miraculous birth, and God spoke to the parents and said through an angel, hey, this, this dude is going to set up the Messiah. He's going to be the advanced man for the Messiah. He's going to tick a lot of people off. He's going to be a wild man. Folks aren't going to invite him to parties. Kings are going to hate his guts, but I got a ministry for him. 
He had a course to do. And he was finishing his course saying, hey, no, I'm not. No, 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 dudes. No, I'm not the Messiah. The, the, the guy I baptized over there, that's the Messiah. He was finishing his course. And now to these believers and to us, God says through his word, look in verse 26, brothers, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. So not only John the Baptist, not only Joseph, not only Moses, but us, we've given, we've been given the gospel, this message of salvation. Application, write this down, and you got to write fast. My God wants to use me in my days to join what he's already doing for eternity. My God wants to use me in my days to join what he's already doing for eternity. Some of you don't believe that. And so you're just living your lives, and then again, you're going to, hopefully you're a Christian, maybe you're not. You think you're a Christian, but you're not. Because, by the way, a Christian has the Holy Spirit living in him. And the Holy Spirit is driving us to become more and more like Jesus. And being more and more like Jesus, Jesus said, I always do the Father's will. That's why I've come to do the Father's will. God, the Father is working, and I joined him in it, Jesus said. And so if that's not my passion, then, I, you know, is, do you even have the Holy Spirit? Are you really a believer, or are you just a professor? Are you just a church member and not really a Christian? You need to analyze that. If you don't have any passion for the will of God, then is the Holy Spirit really in you? Because the Holy Spirit is going to be molding you into the image of Christ. But how do I even know what God's will is, John? I mean, how do I even know it's all nebulous? It's all, no, 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 no. It's not. The will of God is, is very, very simple. What do you mean it's simple? Here's, here's where 95% of the will of God is found. Joshua talks about it. Be careful to obey all the instructions of Moses, all right? That's the Bible up to that time that, that Moses gave you. Then, 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 and only then will you be successful in how much? Everything you do. Study this book. Oh, John, I'm not very good at Bible reading. Yeah, but you can binge on your Netflix. Well, I, I, see, sometimes I don't do much counseling because I'm not very good at counseling because some, I just want to say, just I've already told you. You've been in church for five years. I have counseled you over the pulpit for how many hours? You aren't listening. All you got to do is listen. All you got to do is get in the Word of God and do what it says. But so many of us are ignorant of the Word of God. And it's your fault. It's your fault. I, I don't want to get to heaven and God go, John, it's your fault. I hope to God that's not. And that's why I, I preach the happy stuff and the sad stuff from the Word of God. So that when you get to heaven, you don't go, well, he never told me. <laughs> Didn't tell me I couldn't whore around. Didn't tell me I was really a boy because I got boy parts. So I'm telling you, it's on you. It's on you. We could try to lead you to the water, but you got to drink. Study this book of instruction. How often? Uh, every Sunday. Huh? Say it. Continually, then, not only there, don't stop there, meditate on it day and night. Why, why, why? So you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then, only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Now, survey. How many want to prosper and succeed in all you do? Come on. All right, some of you are like, I'm, 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 I'm all right as a loser. Here's how. This is the word of God. Here is how. But you know what? A whole bunch of you will leave today, a nice sermon, John, happy 25th, and won't do it. And then you'll come to me and go, can I have a counseling appointment? My life sucks. <laughs> no. Fix yourself. Get in the Word of God. You know, if you just get in the Word of God and, med and do this way, well, John, I have my Bible reading app. Cool, 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 cool. Study this book. Continually meditate on it day and night. You'll be successful. God says, here's how to be successful. Here's how to find my will. Only then will you succeed and prosper in all that you do. Here's the, I want you to write this down. I find God's will for me in God's word for me. I find God's will for me in God's word for me. Well, John, it won't tell me who to marry. It'll tell you who not to marry. Some of you are dating people you shouldn't date. Well, we're just dating. Yeah, well, just dating turns into just marriage and just babies and then just divorce. Right? 
God will direct you. 95, it doesn't say, thou shalt marry Bill and have thy tribe. It doesn't say that. But it, it sure gives you a whole lot of direction on who to look for, ladies, and a man. Shows what a godly man is. Dudes. Shows what a godly woman is. What do we do? Woo, look at her. Look at her. Yeah, look at her through the lens of God's word. And you might see something different. Amen? Some of you are like, but John, I've already made that mistake. Sucks to be you. <laughs> you can get fixed. You can get fixed. All right? Just a lot harder. Should have started out better. Amen? I find God's will for me in God's word for me. Say, I find God's will for me in God's word for me. Some of you are going to go home and not open your Bible until next week. Don't call me looking for a counseling appointment if that's you. I'll talk to you. No, I won't. I'll delegate it to one of the guys. But <laughs> I love you. It just gets irritating. You want a professional to fix you in, in, in an hour and you've been disregarding the fix? Huh? So own it, own it, own it, and do it. Man, I don't know how he stayed around here 25 years. <laughs> Success equals finding God's will for my life and joining him in it, amen? Because he's already working his plan. He's already at work. We don't have to get him off the throne. He's already working. I don't have to beg and, beg and plead God to get interested in my life. I don't. Listen, God's already doing a work in your family. He is already at work. He wants you to join him. What he's doing, what you're doing is you're trying to do something else to fix your family. You're trying to, oh, you know, you saw somebody on Oprah or something. You bought a book off the internet. Why not get in the word of God? He'll tell you what to do to fix your family. He'll tell you where you stink. He'll tell you where you need to change first. He's already doing the work in our nation too, by the way. Oh, America's going to hell. Right? He's doing the work. We just need to figure out what that is and get involved. Oh, and by the way, it's not politics. Okay? You political people. He's already doing the work in this church. We just need to figure out what he's doing, and we've, we've, we're identifying it. We've identified it, but we're honing down and join it. We saw that up close in Nicaragua firsthand this past week. We saw a shift. We thought something, and then we saw a shift. We're like, okay, God's really working over here. And so we had to say, what do we, you know, we could have said, no, this is our plan. This is what we've been telling the people. Still in Nicaragua, shift. What do you mean? What do you mean? Stay tuned. Stay tuned. I ain't going to tell you today. I'm sorry. I know you. some of you hate it. I hate it when you tease us. Sorry. It'll keep it coming back next week. <laughs> but John, you know, joining God and all that stuff is kind of scary. It's kind of scary. But John, I'm a new Christian. But John, I'm a retiree. But John, I can't. I know. You're right. You've never been more right. You're, you can't. You can't. But he can't. You can, through him, empowering you. Amen? You do it at his strength and not my strength. Which leads to point number two. We're set up by God for success for God. Point number two, God has already provided the power. He's already provided it. Well, what do you mean, John? What do you mean? Look in verse number 26. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been set the message of this salvation. What is that message? That's the gospel. To us has been sent this message of salvation, the gospel. That's the, the power of God unto salvation, the dynamite. I don't, those of you that think you've got to argue somebody into heaven, you'll never argue anybody into heaven. You don't have enough rash, rationale, enough logic to argue anybody through the, the pearly gates. You don't. That's not how it works. Here's how it works. Romans 1.16, Paul writing this to the Romans. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Some of you are. But I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Say the gospel. The gospel for it, the gospel is the power of God, the dunamis in the Greek, dynamite, for salvation. For what? For salvation, you don't get saved without the gospel to everyone who believes. It's the gospel that does the work, not you. You just give the gospel. The gospel is really, I love this analogy, and I used one time, and it scared everybody because I had a hand grenade, pulled the pin. 
It was a dummy grenade. We pull a pin. And so when you give the gospel, what you're doing is you got the gospel. Some of you, you got, you got a whole bandolero of, 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 of grenades. You never pull them off and toss them. You got tons of gospel. You just never give the gospel. So, oh, John, I wish so-and-so would get saved. Have you ever given the gospel? Well, no, I'm just trying to talk to you about creation versus evolution. No, no, stop it. Stop it. Just pull off, pull the pin, throw it in their lives. And God, sometimes it's a time-delayed fuse. Sometimes it explodes a long time later. Sometimes it explodes immediately. And God does his power in them. You can't save anybody. You can't. So I had the power of the gospel. And then not only that, I don't just have the power of the gospel. I shouldn't say just, but I also have here the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1, Jesus said, we've talked, this is like the core text of the whole book of Acts. You will receive power, same word. You will receive it. You don't drum it up. It's not because you're so amazing, so smart, so handsome. You will receive power when, when, when? When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then you'll be my witnesses, faith sharers in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we've, well, I, can, I can be empowered by God's Holy Spirit. But some of you have never been filled with the Holy Spirit. You've received the Holy Spirit. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. When you trust Jesus, you've got the Holy Spirit, but he doesn't have all of you. He has not filled all of you. That's one thing I pray every day, multiple times a day. Holy Spirit, fill me. Please fill me. I don't, I don't want to do this in my strength. I want to do it in yours. I pray it before every, every time I get up before I speak. I pray it before every meeting I have, every counseling appointment I have. I, I pray it. I don't want it to be me. I want it to be him, his power, not mine. So I receive the filling of the Holy Spirit by faith. <coughs> Application. Write this down. I've got access to all the power and supply I'll ever need for his success. I've got access to it. His gospel and the filling of his Holy Spirit. I don't go down to Nicaragua, face a bunch of people who I can barely communicate with, who have a different culture, totally different culture than mine, <coughs> that I can't even really understand in my own strength. Like, man, John, I could never do that. Me, me neither. Me either. Left to myself, I could do nothing. I could do nothing. But I pray <coughs> ahead of time, obviously, but also right before I get up to be translated by Pastor Jose and say, Lord, fill me with your power because I can't do this in my own strength. I don't want this just to be some gringo telling stories. And I share the gospel of Jesus. Pull the grenade. And God accomplishes his will through me by his power. When are you going to start doing it God's way? When are you going to start doing it in your marriage God's way? Because a bunch of you are trying it your way, aren't you? Or Oprah's way or whoever's way. Book you bought on Amazon way. When are you going to start doing it God's way? One thing that has just it helped Robin and my marriage just amazingly is, is that both of us seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when we get in an argument, inevitably it will come back to, yeah, that answer was not from Jesus. And, I, and we'll own it. Yeah, when I barked at you, that, that, that was my flesh. Because the Bible says, I mean, it's real easy to tell if you're filled with the Spirit or not. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, faith. All right, so if you see that, it's probably coming from a person that's filled with the Holy Spirit. But the works of the flesh, you got the fruit of the Spirit, that, that he produces in you, and the works of the flesh are these, anger, variance, strife, dissensions, all of these things that many of you, your marriage is that. It's the work of the flesh. Well, I tell you what, if she just stop it, why don't you be a spiritual leader in your home? And at least if one of you is filled with the Holy Spirit, it tends to flow over. It tends to be seen. Ladies, that's why in what, First Peter, he says, ladies, you can win your scallywag husband who doesn't even like Jesus, not by nagging. Don't say that. That's in the Greek. That's John's translation. <laughs> it says without a word, without a word. But I just, if I would say it one more time, I know he'd get it. I know if I just, I'm not saying it right, so I'm going to say it 100 times until I find the right. No. You do it by when he sees Jesus in you. When you're empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. He doesn't promise it'll happen overnight. That's your power. 
But no, we, we lean on our own little feeble, piddling, never working power. Trying to raise our kids in the flesh. You parents that scold your kids and holler at your kids. And you try to discipline them with shame. That's not of God. That's of Satan. Satan's the accuser. I'm not saying don't, don't, don't talk to them about what they're screwing up. No. Be, be, get in their face on that. But do it with the love of Christ. Do it with the love of Christ. Some of the most powerful moments in my life, and you know I was a scallywag, with my father, was when he would come to me occasionally, it only happened a few times, and said, I was wrong, I'm sorry. Whoa. I mean, phew. My dad's a big old farmer. He didn't show emotions, and he didn't apologize hardly ever because he was always right. <laughs> but he usually was. But there were times when he disciplined me or he said something, and he came back, and it just, whew. So parents, when you need to, be humble to your child. And if you did something and you screwed up, you admit it because then you'll teach them to be forgivers too. Amen? So when are you going to start doing it God's way? We are set up for success. Number three, we're set up by God for success for God. How? Number three, <laughs> the scary one. God has already chosen his people. He's already chosen his people. And this is some, <clears throat> some of you that have seen this text. I was told by a family member, I don't like that verse. When I showed it to her, it's a verse that's changed my paradigm on what we're going to talk about. It's, it's, but it's a huge and comforting truth if you get it. If you get this thing, God has already chosen his people. You're going to say, John, man, why do you guys, you know, spend a lot of time and money flying all over Latin America? How do you even know if it's worth it, man? You know, they're taking advantage of you over there. What? How do you even know that anybody will listen to you, a gringo? How, how do you know? Because I've got God's promise. But what do you mean you've got God's promise? Well, it's a promise and a prophecy. Revelation 5, this is at the end. And they're praising Jesus. For you were slain, and by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Every single one. You ransomed them from every tribe and language and people and nation. We've got God's promise. God already has a chosen people in every tribe, in every language, in every people, in every nation. There's not a nation I can go to that I think, man, we might not have success here. Now, success needs to be defined by God. Success is not always just numbers, amen? Back, I wasn't going to use this, but I'll, I'll use it. The, one of my favorite dead guys, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he was searching. He was a church kid, and he was searching on how to be saved because for whatever reason, the, the churches weren't really preaching, you know, just salvation and, and, and clearly, and he was just, it was just tearing him up, and he was like, I forget, 10 years old. And he would go to a different church. I don't know where his parents were. He would go to a different church in London, England, and, 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 and trying to find out, how do you come to Jesus? He was so worried about that. I, I, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. And so one snowy day, he stumbles into this old Methodist church, just stumbles in there, and because it's so blizzardy, the preacher hadn't even shown up. Only about six people were there. And the deacon realized, well, and they're all huddled around this pot-bellied stove, all six of them. Not even talking to each other. And this deacon says, well, somebody needs to preach him. But he don't know what to preach. And so he just reads a passage out of Isaiah, and he says just, you do something wrong. look to the cross, look to the cross. He just preaches the bare gospel. And Spurgeon says in his own testimony, my heart sitting around that pot-bellied stove was strangely warmed, and I got up knowing I had trusted Jesus. Just this little stinking out of the way place, little church pastor wasn't even there, and God used Charles Haddon Spurgeon. We still read his books today. This is from the 1800s. He's called the Prince of Preachers. Impacted more preachers than probably anybody but Paul. And God used this unknown deacon in the middle of a blizzard. God says, Don't despise the, 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 the days of small things. Don't despise that. Don't despise the little things that you tell your kids, the little answers you give your kids. Don't despise the being out there and, and, and serving in the nursery or serving out there somewhere in the parking lot. You think, oh, this is, God might greatly use you just with one little phrase, one little time to impact somebody who's going to impact the world. That's how God works. Mustard seed, amen? Mustard seed. God has already chosen his people out of every tribe, 
every language, every tongue. And that means he's already chosen. This isn't a crapshoot. What we're doing isn't a crapshoot. It's not a hope so. What is it? It's a rescue op. It's a rescue op. They're there. They're here. He's chosen them. So let's go out and reach them. He's got a chosen people in Nicaragua. He's got a chosen people in Cuba. He's got a chosen people in Peru. He's got a chosen people in P-Town. Amen? He's got a chosen people. We are guaranteed success. To me, that's just thrilling. If we're following his will to reach those he's chosen and using his power, the gospel, and, and being full of the Holy Spirit of God. Well, John, I just don't like the word chosen. Ha! Well, hate to be Billy Bummer to you, but it's all through the word of God. Just a few. I had to cut these way back. Just got a few. The Lord your God has, say it, chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the people who are on the face of the earth. Matthew Jesus, many are called, but few are what? Chosen. How many are chosen? Few. He's a chooser. He chooses his people. This is called the bride of Christ. Guess what? Jesus has the privilege of choosing his bride. Amen? But John, Jesus, he chose me. Yeah, okay, because he knew I'd choose him. You are so cute in your junior theologian britches. (laughs) This <laughs> is what Jesus said. You did not choose me, but I what? I chose you. I initiated it and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Now, if you're chosen, you come to Christ, then you're supposed to be bearing fruit, people. If you're not bearing fruit, spiritual fruit, you ought to check and see if your salvation is really real. So here's, well, John, I don't like, I just don't, I don't like this teaching. <laughs> All right, write this down. If God, if God clearly says it, it's up to me to believe it. Even if I can't understand it, even if I don't like it. If God clearly says it, and he does, it's up to me to believe it. Even if I can't understand it. Even if I don't like it. Amen? Some of you don't like this. I didn't like this. I was taught against this. Matter of fact, I was taught free will. Free will. It's your free will. You're a free will moral agent. You aren't. We'll get to that, maybe. All of this sets up a scary to some of you text. Like, John, where are you going with this? So it's in our text. I don't know if you saw it. You were supposed to underline it when we went by. So Paul is preaching. He's preaching to Gentiles. And when the Gentiles heard this, so they hear the word of God, right? He's preaching the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. So he's got the gospel, power of the gospel, power of the Holy Spirit. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing woo-hoo, and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were <laughs> appointed to eternal life believed. Whew. One lady in my family said, and I was sharing this with her. She's like, I don't, even, I don't like that verse. She loves the word of God. But she didn't like that verse. Some of you don't like that verse. Now, when I first came across this verse, I tried to switch it. I thought maybe the translators got it wrong. Maybe they flipped it, right? So really it's supposed to be as many as believed were appointed appointed to eternal life. Mm -hmm. That would fit some of your paradigms a whole lot better, wouldn't it? Because that's what you think. That's what you believe. That if you believe, then you're appointed to eternal life. But that's a little Greek lesson. Appointed. So you look. It's the Greek word tasso which is translated other places, ordained, ordained to eternal life. That doesn't help you out. Assigned, assigned to eternal life. Mm. Designated, designated to eternal life. It means what it says, whichever translation you're in. Now, some of you are like, this is blowing my mind. I, I don't know what to say. I don't like this. Join the crowd. Today you'll hear from Rich Chassie. He's a pastor that... that uh, served here with me years ago, and now he's pastoring the church that I left 25 years ago to come here. He's been up there 25 years. And Rich and I were at some conference, I forget, in Grand Rapids, I think. And I was just beginning to wrestle with this thing of election, predestination, choosing. And he came to my hotel room, and we stayed, I don't know, Rich, till it seemed like 3 o'clock in the morning, and I argued with him. 
I argued with him, and, and I wrestled with this thing and wrestled with this thing. So if you're mad at me today, it's Rich's fault. That's what I'm saying. I mean, it just it, it took a long time for me to understand. And I don't totally, I don't totally understand the election predestiny. You know, nobody does. They've argued about it for 2,000 years, okay? But when you look at the Word of God, there's some things you cannot ignore in the Word of God. And this is one of them. As many as we're appointed to eternal life believe. That means that God appoints some to eternal life. Well, that means that he doesn't appoint some. This is the meat of the Word. All right? You, I hope you come in here and think, I hope John preaches the whole Word of God to me. And, and just doesn't namby-pamby around. Amen? And, and, and just, you know ignore hot topics, doesn't preach on the hot things that are going on and doesn't equip me out there. This is the gristle of the word of God. This is not the Bible baby formula. Some of you up to now, you've, you've just been feeding yourself on Bible baby formula. You are. And you come to church and we burp you and we change your diaper and send you back out. You need to, you need to step and start eating meat. Now this is meat. Well, I just, I know, I just blown some of you. I know, I know. When I first came here, I was preaching through the book of James. James has a verse in there about God's election. And so I preached on it as a new pastor. And we lost some people. Got some mean emails. I can't edit the word of God, people. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Buy this book. All right, if you really, really, this helped me so much. Chosen by God. It's written for regular Joe. It's not written for theologians, but it's awesome. R.C. Sproul. Chosen by God. It's not a big book, but it, it, he lays it out so very well. And I've, every time somebody comes to me with a question, I just buy the book first. I'm not going to argue with you until you read the book. Well, John, if I believe that, if I believe, you know, that God appoints people to eternal life, some, and he chooses, which is, by the way, in Scripture all through, then, 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 then if I believe that, I, I wouldn't worry about witnessing. I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't worry about sharing my faith, man. Well, that attitude proves several things. One, that you don't understand Scripture. Secondly, that you're probably kind of lazy, looking for a way out, right? And people do. I, I admit they use this truth to say, well, God's got it all. He's going to do it. No, no. Look at this, though. That, that attitude proves that we, we don't understand Scripture. This next verse that continues, as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, and what happened? The word of God, the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. In other words, that didn't limit evangelism. That they, they were basically saying, wow, God has chosen his people. All I need to do is pull the pin, toss the grenade, and, and urge people to come to Jesus, and then those who are chosen will respond they will come. We will have a harvest. All the hard work's done by Jesus. Amen? Cross, dying, burial, resurrection, giving us the word of God, giving us the power of the Holy Spirit. All I got to do is share the gospel. Whew. Takes a lot of pressure off me. But it also drives me to go, you know what? In every, every little town in Nicaragua I go to, God has already chosen some folks, and he's already been there working on them, wetting their appetite. We see it over and over again. In my ministry in these, in these last 25 years and beyond, that is huge. The biblical understanding of this meaty truth doesn't limit or minimize evangelism. It maximizes it. The, the greatest evangelist of early America, Ann Spurgeon and others, believed this to their core. And it drove them to preach the gospel. Why? Because wherever God sends us, he's already got a people there. He's already got his people there, guaranteed results. Isaiah 55 has it this way. So my word shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that to which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God says, I'm going to make sure that my purpose is fulfilled every time my word is preached. That's God working ahead of you, folks. Whether I preach here or down in Nicaragua or in my mama's little country church or in a jail in P-Town, God's already been working there, tilling, tilling hearts, the soil of hearts, making his chosen people thirst. I'm not called to argue an atheist into heaven, to talk anybody out of unbelief. I'm simply called to share the gospel. Some of you are complicating this way too much. Some of you who love to argue, man, you, you, you're actually, I think, hurting the cause of Christ. Because you like to be more intelligent than the atheist. You like to win the argument, but you never win the soul. 
I'm, I'm simply called to share the gospel. Urge them to trust Jesus and let God give the result. It makes it so much simpler. What does all this mean? It means that my God is large and in charge of everything. See, you thought, a lot of you think still, that God is in charge of everything but salvation. He controls the seas, he controls the oceans, he controls the universe. You know, he knows what those astronauts are doing up there and they're not going to come back till February, which is weird. God's in control of everything except my salvation. That's me. That's my choice. Oh, no. Application. I know some of you are like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. God has guaranteed my faith sharing success by choosing his people in advance. But what about free will, John? What about free will? We don't have time. We don't, oh, I wish we had time. We don't have time. But I will say this, all right? My pastors are like, you ain't got time. Don't do it. I'm going to do it. You had free will once. You did. One time only. In the Garden of Eden. And you chose poorly through Adam and Eve. They have free will. They, God says, in the day you eat of it, you will surely what? Die. They didn't die bodily, physically. They didn't die emotionally, rationally. How'd they die? Spiritually. So our spirits from that point on are dead. Dead. That means we cannot respond to God. We respond and connect to God with our spirits. And we can't. And so some of you think that you chose God when your spirit was dead. God has to, and I don't have time to go into it, regenerate you, make you alive in Christ, and regeneration precedes salvation. doesn't follow. It precedes. He makes you alive. You see Jesus. You say, I want Jesus. Bam! It happens like that in a microsecond. But he has to make you alive because we're like, we're like Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> Titanic out there floating. He's holding on. She says, I'll never let you go. Oops. Blip, 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 blip. <laughs> Two days later, rescue boat comes by. Here's Leonardo floating. They're like, Leonardo, Leonardo, grab a hold of this rope. Leonardo, Leonardo, grab a hold of this rope. Is Leonardo going to grab a hold of the rope? No, why not? He's dead. He's dead. Leonardo is dead. He can't. But we think that we can grab a hold of the rope, and then we come to Jesus. No, 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 you're dead spiritually. You cannot connect to God at all unless God regenerates you. That's what this is. I know, I know, it's, it's, it's gristle. It's gristle. Well, John, what do I do? What do I do? I've got so many questions. Don't come to me. Chosen by God. <laughs> Read that first. Read that first. Now, well, 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 how do I know who's elect, who's chosen, John? You don't. I love that. Well, then what do we do? I love that old quote. Again, this Spurgeon attributed to Spurgeon back in the day. Throw it up there, boys. If God would have painted a yellow stripe on the backs of the elect, I'd go around lifting shirts. But since he didn't, I must preach whosoever will, and then whosoever believes, I know he's one of the elect. Make sense? Some of you in here, you're like, I don't, you know, I don't think I have Jesus. Do you want Jesus? Do you want Jesus? Well, yeah, I think I want Jesus. Cool, then you're elect. Come to Jesus, whosoever will. Sit there and go, ah, it doesn't matter to me, then you probably ain't. Or at least, you know, it ain't working on you yet. God doesn't set up his people to fail. He doesn't send his people to fail. We're set up by God for success for God in this church and in our personal lives. We are. My buddy Steve Swanson and I will tell this and I'm done. I trusted Jesus. I told you the story in my Navy barracks room. And now I'm thinking about all my buddies you know, who, and especially Steve, I went to church with Steve, and so I figured he was in the same condition I was, you know, religious but lost, believing intellectually but never uh, trusting Jesus experientially. And so I'm driving back on leave, and I'm driving back, and I'm praying almost the whole way. I'm, I'm not lying. A thousand miles, I'm praying, God, you know, use me and these guys, all of them, uh, my buddies, but Lord, use me with Steve and Sue. They had recently got married. So I come to their house, that they're in this little farmhouse, uh, they're brand new, couple brand new married, and I, I come out there, and they say, you know, I'm just nervous as mess, around my best bud, nervous, because I wanted to share the gospel, and I was scared to death, like many of you. And so they said, hey, uh, hey here's some pizza, man, hey, hey, there's the show's on TV, it was on TV, so this is before 
video cassettes. This show's coming on. They're playing it again. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's the omen. You ever seen it? No, let's watch it. It was Hollywood's idea of the Antichrist, which God was setting it up. Because unbeknownst to them, in church here, we had been studying the book of Revelation. So they had all these questions. And then so we talked about it afterwards. And I'm talking about Revelation, the Antichrist, the things I'm learning. And then they're like, oh, man, that's bad. I'm like, and I was able to transition. Yeah, yeah, make sure that you have a relationship with Jesus. So I told them how I trusted Jesus in my Navy barracks room. And then I didn't have enough guts to pray with them. So I said, make sure you pray and trust Jesus. See ya. Sounded like a wimp. But Steve said, and he sent me a letter. He said, after you left, we talked about it. And both Stu and I knelt next to my bed and prayed and trusted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And God set that whole thing up. Amen? And that's what he's doing in your families. And that's what he's doing in Nicaragua. And that's what he's doing here. We don't have to make it up. We just join him. Amen? And it's been an amazing, amazing ride. 25 years ago, came back to this church as your lead pastor. It's been an amazing ride. You know, there have been ups and downs. But it's, it's been 25 years of mainly joining God in what he's doing. And I've made mistakes. I've hurt some of your feelings. Some of you are like, yeah, this morning. <laughs> Last week, Robin was looking at this book that you guys gave us for a 20th anniversary. And in it are, you know, a lot of pictures and stuff for 20 years. On the back page is the most important page. And that's how many salvations and baptisms had been in 20 years through Point Harbor here. And, and so I, I had an idea, and I, I texted the ladies. And uh, Ashley got back to me, and she said, I said, how many salvations from when I came here till that we have recorded? In, in 25 years, we've recorded 1,922 salvations and 1,479 baptisms. Amen. <laughs> And it's been an amazing ride, Point Harbor. And, but as you know, I've been praying for at least 10 more years. If you'll have me, and you better. In which time, I pray, we'll see over 25 times those results. You're like, 20, hang with me. We'll get there. How? How? We're working on an exciting, faith-driven, Satan-slapping 10-year plan that I'm going to be unveiling on September 29th. It just so happens I had scheduled to preach on the Macedonian call. Macedonian vision. I, I didn't set that up. I said that months ago. I said, ah, divided the book of Acts. So the 29th, I thought, is that? Oh, that's the Macedonian call. Look at God. Look at what God's doing. It's going to take prayer and faith and sacrifice, probably some fasting, a bunch more of you getting involved. And I am stoked. I am stoked. So, hey, Point Harbor, let's answer his call. Amen. Let's answer his call. We are really are, we really are set up by God for success for God. Amen? Amen. Lord, use us, fill us. And Lord, help us to not say, no, I'm, I, I don't want to be a part of that. Lord, help us step out in faith and equip us as we know you will. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. Amen. Pastor Tom. Thank you, Pastor John. Appreciate that message. Um, before we... Uh, get to talking about John and Robin here in a few minutes. Let me just say, if you're here for the very first time, thank you so much for being here. You are our welcome guest. Uh, please, I would ask everyone to please uh, scan the QR code in front of you, or you can text or, uh, whoops, thank you, uh, go to pointharbor.church and fill out that connection card. Share with us any prayer requests, uh, any decisions. If you prayed and trusted that, that would be the greatest gift you could give to John and Robin if you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. Make sure you, you take a moment to fill that uh, card out and let us know that you are here. We thank you for being here. Now, it is, I, I guess I'm just, it's a privilege for me to be able to honor John and Robin. We've been friends since the late 80s. We drove, John and I drove, eight hours twice a week for two years to Liberty University. And I can say this, he is who he says he is. As you get to know him, as you hear him preach, he's the same 
He's the same whether you're in a car with him or whatever. He lives what he preaches, and so that means so much to me to be able to honor them. John and Robin, thank you so much for 25 years. And the fact that he's included me in this ministry, invited me to be here, is a, a special privilege and pleasure uh, to be here. But don't just take my word. I'm going to ask Rich Chassie. Rich Chassie was on staff here, as John explained. He also uh, took over his church, and that's a big deal to recommend somebody take over a church you put your heart and soul into. So, Rich. I, I just want to share a couple of words with you about uh, John and John and Robin. Uh, the first word is the word caring. John is someone who cares about the people that God has called him to minister to. The first time that Sherry and I, my wife, uh, we met John, we actually didn't meet him. Sherry and I had come to visit the church way back when. This is early 90s. And uh, I, we didn't get to meet John that on that Sunday morning. Lots of folks around. and and But John was in charge of the young couple's ministry and came to our house and rang the doorbell and we were there and we did not answer. <laughs> we knew who it was and they must be from the church is what we thought. And this was back in the day when churches actually did that kind of thing. The world has kind of changed in recent years and and so we don't have that kind of stuff going on anymore. But I think he actually came one more time, and we also ignored him the second time. And, but we started going to uh, the, the class that, that he led, and he cared about my wife and I enough to put that effort and that time in. And in a very real way, I had already graduated from college with a degree in Bible, already been to seminary, and I was at a point in my life where I think God couldn't use me. I was too broken. I was too caught up in my own sinful habits and just didn't feel like God had any purpose for my life. And, and John wouldn't let me get away with that. And as soon as we started getting involved in the ministry here, John went from taking a hand and reaching out and rescuing us to putting his arm around us and saying, welcome to the team. Let's get busy serving God together. And, and that's, what he, that's what he will do with you as well. He will love you. He will care about you. And then once you're in and participating, you're going to be a part of the team reaching people for Christ. The second word I want to share with you is the word faithful. That's what God calls us to be. Those of us who are in ministry, it's not ours. We are simply stewards of what God has called us to. And John has been faithful in serving this ministry for 25 years. You are the fruit of that. And he has been faithful throughout his time in ministry. And I believe that he will, when the time comes, when he has served God's purpose in his generation and the Lord calls him home, I believe he will hear those words, welcome, good and faithful servant. The one more thing I want to actually ask John is, do you have one of those hand grenades that I can have it's an excellent illustration. Thank you. We love you, John and Robin. Thank you very much. We also have three videos that we'd like to share with you. Uh, the first one is from Mark and Ramona. They served together. He was actually co-pastor for a while. Jerry Tucker, who did our music, and then our founding pastor, the one we're all tied to, Lynn Hardaway. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, Mark and Ramona here, pausing to reflect on more than 30 years of friendship as we celebrate your silver anniversary at Point Harbor. John, 
God has used your teaching style and your down-to-earth nature to help me see myself in new light, encouraging me to make adjustments and changes as I strive to serve him better. Thank you for your faithful service to God, to your friends, and to your flock. Robin, I so appreciate your tenderheartedness and your encouraging nature. You have shown me how to listen to the message underneath the message because you were always trying to see me underneath any facade I, have, I tried to erect. Although I haven't told you enough, your friendship mentored me through life struggles, relationship struggles, and spiritual struggles. We are blessed to have been able to serve with you and blessed to be able to call you our friends. 25 years. I've never held a job for 25 years, so congratulations to both of you. Um, we are very proud to have served with you, and um, you've always made ministry fun, uh, even though we know that there were many tears along the way. We are confident that God has seen every one of them, so thank you. Happy anniversary, John, Robin. Way to go, 25 years. That's amazing. In our culture, that's really something because the average pastor research shows is about seven years. And in some research says that for pastors and uh, leaders to be effective, they've got to be there between 11 and 20 years. And you've blown those numbers out of the water. God has been so good to you. You know, I can only attribute this to both your Robin, your family, the leadership team, and the body of Christ. There's dedication to following God's will and his word over your own. Uh, this type of sustained impact is a blessing from God and it's just not quite often seen in our culture. So I'm so happy for you guys. I pray and uh, wish that you enjoy many, many more years to come. And on behalf of uh, someone who's benefited from your service to the Lord and the body of Christ, let me just say thank you and congratulations. Happy anniversary. Twenty-five years. That's just amazing, John and Robin, that you've stayed at this great church for so long. You know that's way above average for pastors and their families in churches, but I'm so proud of you. It's hard to believe that it's been 40 years since we met. We were in our 20s back then when we were first starting out in the ministry, and I have a lot of good memories of those days prior to you being the pastor of the church. I I think I remember one of our skits, you dressing up in a dress. I believe that happened. But I knew then that you were, uh, you put your heart in all the ministries that you did. You were a competent leader. You just excelled in everything that you did. I knew you would go far. I didn't know in those days that you would be back at uh, Point Harbor Community Church. But when the time came for me to uh, step away from the pastorate, I knew that there was only one man that I would trust with the future of that church, and that was John Houston. I did receive calls from uh, VIPs in the Independent Baptist Movement with their ideas of who should take that church, but there was only one, and uh, you and your family have just done a fabulous job, and thank you for your faithful service to the Lord, and thank you, too, for your faithful friendship. I will say, I think that endeared me to you, John, seeing you in that dress with that tattoo on the arm. <laughs> John, Robin, come on up here for a minute. You know, what Rich said is very true. They will love you. They've loved me and they've loved Nancy through some really difficult times. Been there, supported us, encouraged us. Times where I'm sure he wanted to just kick me out. He was forgiving and gracious towards me. And, you know, Robin is behind the scenes. And I know she does not like this. Uh, but I tell you, there's nobody that will love you more and better than Robin. And supports him and puts up with him. And all the things that he says in the pulpit. <laughs> Dan, Michelle, we have a few gifts for you guys. There's no way anything we do could adequately express our appreciation for 25 years. 
<laughs> and then some other gifts there. Now we are going to have uh, some cupcakes in. Testing one, two, three. Uh, is is uh, my kids? Are which of my kids are in here? Are any of my kids in here? On, gonna, Do they they're, care? They're going to be in the second service. They're going to be in the second service. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, I and, and so like, I, I, Tom mentioned it, but I'll just reiterate it that uh, being married to a pastor is no picnic, honestly. Um, and you know, Robin has gone through uh, having a wolf in the flock, having she sat on the front row when I had to. Uh, face a guy who was tearing up the church in Michigan. She said, I, I said, honey, you don't need to be there. She goes, I'm going to be on the front row. So he knows that I'm supporting you in this. She's been there for me for everything. She said, I'll follow you. I trust you. And, and she's done it for these 25 years here, five years in Michigan, six and a half years here before, uh, going to Bible college, leaving her dad not happy. Um, and he was not happy. And we went out and, and did that. And she's, she just trusted me. And it's been rough. There's been times when there's no food in the house. I've told you those stories. I won't go into it. But I, I thank you so much, baby. I love you so much. Wouldn't want to have done it with anybody else. <laughs> and my kids. You know, being a kid's, uh, pastor's kid is always, because it's always this expectation. And they're always here, right? Always at the church. So that's why a lot of pastor's kids, they don't want anything to do with the ministry because they've had so much of it. For so long, and my kids all loved Jesus and, and supported us and worked in ministries and painted things and built things and were here late at night when nobody else was. And so I appreciate my kids, and I get to tell them in the next service on that. So thank, but I thank you. You've been a great church. I know I'm rough on you sometimes. You deserve it. I love you. <laughs>